Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What You Gonna Cue, the only video series currently broadcasting from the detention level on the Death Star. For those of you who may be new to the show, What You Gonna Cue is a weekly video series in which we highlight some of the best titles that Netflix has to offer, with recommendations broken down into three categories. Instant Karma, where we recommend some of the best instant titles to watch before they expire. What the f*** is this? where we highlight some of the obscure or overlooked titles buried in the annals of Netflix, and For Your Consideration, where the recommended titles tie into a timely, predetermined cinematic theme. As always, I'm one of your co-hosts, Jim Rohner. And I'm one of your other co-hosts, Alex Rabinowitz. And as you may notice, we are decked out for Memorial Day, the recent holiday which just passed us by. We hope that everybody was celebrating with parades, fireworks, and hugging veterans of foreign wars. Um, and Alex, uh, I'd like to take this time to also, uh, as, as we all know, Memorial Day is a time to commemorate the fallen soldiers. Right. So I think that uh, we should commemorate the past films that we've watched by recommending them to our viewers. That's a good idea. Great. It's 1975 all over again with 2009 black exploitation parody, Black Dynamite, from director Scott Sanders and writer star Michael Jai White. White plays the titular character Black Dynamite, an ex-CIA agent on a mission to expose a conspiracy that goes all the way to the top. Tommy Davidson, Brian McKnight, Arsenio Hall, and Byron Mills also appear. You're so righteous. This is also true. Black Dynamite is the Citizen Kane of black exploitation parodies. Um, the parody today is in a very poor state of affairs. Um, gone are the days of space balls and airplane, giving way to epic movie, disaster movie, date movie, movie movie. Uh, thankfully, Black Dynamite is in a category with the classics that I mentioned first. Now, educate me a little bit, Alex. Put on your professor cap, and I will put on my ignorant student cap, mm -hmm. and educate me, inform me, what makes Black Dynamite such a good parody? The difference between um, today's lesser parodies and Black Dynamite is how straight Black Dynamite plays it. Uh, you know, a great straight man can provide just as much comedy as the comedic uh, other half, and what Black Dynamite does is it assumes itself to be a black exploitation movie from the 70s. Not once are they winking at the camera or even alluding that they're in on the joke, and therefore the joke is only trumpeted with how committed they are to the bit throughout the entire thing. Uh, let me guess. You one of these brothers think you can get by on a wink and a smile, huh? What about the smile? I am smiling. It, it seems like Black Dynamite isn't really trying to homage anything as much as it seems like it is a film from that era. Exactly, and that was the goal of the filmmakers. The goal was for some random schlub to pick up the movie and not realize that it was made in 2009. Instead, they wanted to make it seem like it was made in the 70s. And the way they did that is with some intentional mistakes, such as um, boom mics in the shot, or um, actors switching roles, uh, just all these crazy, just like, oh, actors reading their um, stage directions. Just <laughs> intentionally making mistakes and mistakes and then what they also did what did was is on set they all assumed um, roles as crew members as well so like it was uh, Michael Jai White playing all-star running back for Ante Jones playing Black Dynamite and even Scott Sanders the director pretended he was someone else who would be making a black exploitation movie and the level of commitment really reads on on screen it's Freaking hilarious movie. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you say that they assume other characters. When should I assume that Black Dynamite uh, expires on instant? Uh, you should assume that it expires on June seventeenth, and I would really recommend watching it. It's a love letter to a great genre. Okay. And so, from a, a, a fake nineteen seventies film that you recommend in section one to a real nineteen seventies film that I'm going to recommend in section two. <laughs> Don't Look Now is an atmospheric horror thriller from British director Nicholas Rogue that follows grieving married couple John and Laura Baxter to Venice, where they hope to begin the recovery process after the death of their young daughter. There, the couple encounters a psychic who claims that their daughter is trying to contact them. While this brings about a positive change in Laura's demeanor, John remains skeptical, ignoring even the ominous premonitions that he soon begins to experience. What is it, Mr. Baxter? What is it you fear? Now I realize that horror isn't everybody's cup of tea, um, but Don't Look Now is not your 
quintessential horror film with you know the the blood and guts and, and overly gory. Uh, Don't Look Now is actually a very psychological, artistic horror film, specifically in how it focuses on uh, a grieving married couple because the relationship is really uh, front and center in this film, uh, and especially in its really convincing depiction of grief and how people are, are dealing with the loss of a loved one. And actually, uh, if you want some critical acclaim behind it, Time Out London actually recently ranked it the number one British film of all time. Of all time? All time. Wow. Yeah. That's that's pretty good. I mean, what, what makes it so great? What gives it that place to be the number one British film of all time? Well, in my opinion, it's the fact that Don't Look Now really gets inside your head. Mm-hmm. Nicholas Rogue used to be a cinematographer before he was a director, and I think that really shows because the way that he uses the camera, especially and its movement and framing of shots of this ancient city of Venice just really cre- creates this this paranoid uh, atmosphere throughout the film. And John and Laura are, are foreigners there, so you're not really sure are people being hostile to them or are they just not sure you know, about the, this culture. And specifically in dealing with the, the idea of, of psychics and precognition, the film uh, uses editing to jumping back and forth between flashbacks and flash forwards, really kind of disorienting the viewer, not really sure what's going on. She is dead! You must find her! Dead, 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 dead! You've got me interested, um, but I, I hear that it's got a bit of a controversial ending. Yeah, uh, people who have seen the film are, are aware of the infamy uh, of the ending. Uh, what, what's great about the film, in my opinion, is that you kind of have these three separate threads going on at all time. You have uh, John's uh, premonitions of what's going on. You have um, you know, them grieving about their, their daughter, and then also these grisly murders that are going on at the same time in Venice. And the ending brings all these threads together uh, in, in, in a way that people either really love or in a way that's kind of bizarre and off-putting. Personally, uh, I pitch my tan in the love camp. Uh, I, really, I really love how, how this film wraps up. All right. Well, you better pitch a tent in the battlefield because mm. we're off to war. In section three. Yeah. On May 5th, 1868, General John A. Logan issued a proclamation that Decoration Day should be observed nationwide as a day to decorate the graves of fallen soldiers. Unofficially changed to Memorial Day in 1882, It wasn't until 1968 that a federal law declared that that should be the official name, Memorial Day, and the date was permanently moved to the last Monday in May. We here at What You Gonna Cue love our country, and we greatly appreciate the men and women of the armed services who have given their lives to protect and serve everything that we love. So to commemorate them, we are dedicating for your consideration to them with some of our favorite war movies. Yay! From Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, the co-creators of Band of Brothers, comes a look at the other theater of war, the Pacific. Told over 10 one-hour parts originally airing on HBO, the miniseries features James Badge Dale, Joseph Mazzello, and John Cena as three interconnected World War II soldiers sent to brave the grisly Pacific Rim. You make the difference between the freedom of the world and it's enslavement. Uh, The Pacific aired last year on HBO, like I said. And for those of you that are familiar with Band of Brothers, I think they'll really enjoy it because it it has similarities, but it offers up a unique perspective on the same war, you know, halfway across the globe. Well, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and play the devil's advocate here. So once again, you are Professor Rabinowitz and I'm your student. So, and I I raise my hand in class and say, "Uh, excuse me, I believe I have seen this before because I've watched Band of Brothers. How do you respond to me? I respond to you, no, you have not. It is completely different. You know, like I said, it's the other half of the war. There were really two wars going on at the same time, and the Pacific is much more ethereal and uh, almost less about the people and more about the situation than Band of Brothers. You really get a great look at how harsh the conditions in the Pacific really were, from the rain to the mountain and forest battles, just till the psychological toll that it took on the individuals. And in that respect, the Pacific offers a different look at the same war. I have to believe that it's all worthwhile because our cause is just. And of course, Memorial Day, a, a day to commemorate the soldiers. So clearly, uh, the Pacific wouldn't be as effective unless we had some some great characters and great people to follow. So tell me a little bit about the soldiers, about the characters we're following in the Pacific. All right, the ca- the characters are these boys that have gone off to war, um, played by James Badgedale, who shows so much depth in his performance, much more than he did on Rubicon and AMC. And then Joseph Mazzello, who yes, is the little boy from Jurassic Park, um, and he over the course of this 10-hour miniseries goes from boy to man and it's really it's a real it's a really amazing transformation and just this mini series can do so much more than a 2 hour movie could in depicting almost every aspect of what 
of what ground combat was like in the Pacific region in World War II. And I think that uh, we should remember the Pacific and remember the soldiers um, and as they're depicted in this miniseries. Mm -hmm. Well, they were island hopping, uh, we're film title hopping. Mm -hmm. My recommendation, Black Hawk Down is based on the true story of the near disastrous Battle of Mogadishu that took place in Somalia on October 3rd, 1993, specifically focusing on the rescue of crews from two destroyed Black Hawk helicopters. Starring Josh Hartnett, Ewan McGregor, and Eric Bana, among others, Black Hawk Down is simultaneously a harrowing tale of the loyalty displayed by the Army Rangers, as well as an exploration of the nuances and complications inherent in all foreign conflicts. So guess what? You're going out today. What? It's what you wanted, isn't it? Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Now, when I was younger and far less culture than I am now, didn't drink as much uh, brandy, didn't have as many monocles, mm. I just assumed that Black Hawk Down was just another war movie. But in retrospect, rewatching it, uh, it, it's really not. It, it's actually a really great film that, go, that goes to a different level. And clearly, I have the critics on my side because upon its release, it actually uh, received six Oscar nominations, including one for uh, Best Direction for Ridley Scott. And age has made you wiser. And now you can see that it belongs in the echelon of great war movies. But, but why do you think that is? What made you change your mind? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, it's based on a true story uh, written by a guy named Mark Bowden, uh, who was a journalist, but uh, chose his writing style almost as though it was a fiction narrative. So it really has that flow to it, but it's got that realism on the ground kind of feel to it as well. Uh, it's an ensemble cast, and Ridley Scott's direction of all his actors is great. They all kind of buy into the vision that he's, he's trying to put forth here. You got uh, from A-listers like Ewan McGregor to Eric Bana, to a lot of, uh, of, of character and supporting actors like Tom Sizemore, uh, William Fichtner. It's not so much focused on the action set pieces as much as the relationships between the people, the emotional involved, but when it does get to the action set pieces, it's really coherent uh, and really tense and really intimate and close, but without being claustrophobic. Nobody has to be a hero. She sometimes turns out that way. Yeah, and it really has it both ways in a lot of different respects. You're absolutely right, and, and like I hinted at in the intro to the film, uh, there, there is both uh, a healthy dose of cynicism towards war, towards conflict, but then also uh, a real reverence and real uh, admiration for the people who are involved in the conflict. A lot of the characters uh, have no illusions that, you know, this is a, a battle that they probably won't win and a war that they shouldn't even be involved with to, you know, to begin with. Mm. But they are still uh, dedicated to their goals, they're dedicated to the service, they're dedicated to each other. And that's really important. That's what makes this movie so effective is the fact that you believe in these relationships, you believe in these characters, and you have to admire that, you know, even if they're fighting a war that we may not agree with, that they might not agree with, they're giving 100% to it. And I think that's such an amazing fact that we just we've lost a lot of times nowadays yeah i agree mm -hmm. and i also like to bring up that if our viewers don't agree with all our picks they have to give respect that we're putting 100 percent of our effort into it i think you're right alex yeah but in those who don't appreciate it will at least appreciate that the show is over so right. yeah so thanks for watching this uh post memorial day episode guys once again you can always reach us on any one of our social media outlets we have a facebook page where you can post a picture of your cue if you need some advice on what to watch and what not to watch we have a Twitter account where we're always posting pretty humorous, funny things in less than 140 characters. And we have a website where we're always posting the latest news on what's going on in the world of Netflix, instant streaming, and just movie watching in general. Thanks again, guys. And remember, until next time, earn this.